Welcome, church family. This is Pastor Tom Loud of Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship in Seattle, Washington, and I want to welcome you here today for our Sunday morning sermon. This uh, will be aired on July 5th, and so I just pray that you all have had a great 4th of July, a good Independence Day, safe and sound, and you didn't get burned or blown up. So <laughs> we're just glad to have you here today. Um, for those of you who can make it out to church, we are opening the church up now. Um, we're in phase two of the COVID-19 uh, epidemic situation. Uh, but if you can't make it, obviously you're here watching us today on video and we'll continue this for as long as is necessary during this crisis. So I just want to welcome you once again. I want to thank all of you out there for your great support, your prayer support, your kind uh, compliments, uh, your financial support, your you know, those that physically show up, your physical support, every kind of support. We just thank you that we have a family of God that uh, sticks together. And uh, we welcome you to come back if you feel safe. Um, today, before our message, we're going to have a little moment of prayer. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, you are God of the universe. There are many people on this earth who think they control many things, but Lord, you are still on the throne and you have the final word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have rescued us from the power of Satan and you have delivered us into the kingdom of your son. We thank you that we have the victory in all matters. We thank you that uh, we have a good ending to our story because we are on the winning side. Lord, we just pray that each and every person out there that's hurting right now, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, minister to those that have need. Those that are sick, we just speak healing over you right now. Be healed in the name of Jesus. And those who have financial issues, we pray God's provision over you right now. We say those that are uh, without jobs, Lord, bless them with jobs right now in Jesus' name. And bless all of your people, Lord, through this thing to come together more tightly knit, closer together, more unified, and cause, Lord, that uh, this thing which the enemy meant for evil, you would use for good to save many, that many people would be drawn to you because of this time where people are reassessing their lives. So, Lord, let your word go out. Let it be powerful. Let your people be safe and protected. Uh, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, if you've missed any of our previous messages, you can find those on our Facebook page, of course, and on our um, Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship YouTube channel. And you can find them uh, on our website, which is at shorelinefullgospel.org. Also, the sermons are posted on my personal YouTube channel, which is Tom Loud. So let's take a moment now and uh, allow my friend, Reverend Aaron Baker, to minister in music. God bless you. Good morning once again. It is time to praise the Lord. We are excited to have you this morning. We welcome you to join your heart, your mind, and your spirit uh, to ours uh, so that we may give the Heavenly Father praise. He is worthy and we lift him up with all that we have this morning. And uh, before we do that, we pray and we give him thanks because he is worthy. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, oh God. We thank you for this opportunity and for the honor, Lord, of coming before you and yielding all that we are and all that we have before you. We ask you to bless our praise today, Lord, and receive it. And we ask you to divide your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
just want to do Amen. Thank you, Brother Aaron. I appreciate all that you do for us, and uh, the leading in music each week has been really a wonderful time of refreshing in the Lord, and we just are appreciative of you. So today, our message is titled, I Hear You. As we all know, communication is something that is essential to any meaningful relationship. Communication was the sole substance of relationship that God established with Adam in the garden. God did not silently watch man and uh, watch Adam walking around and stumbling around the garden, and, and God remained quiet and didn't let himself be known. But God spoke to man, and man was able to speak back to God. 
God did not appear to man, but he came down in the cool of the evening and spoke with him. So we can't even say that there's any evidence that Adam saw any physical signs of God. We can't even say that God gave him a vision or a dream where he saw, you know, some sort of a picture of what God looks like. But we do have evidence from the Bible that Adam indeed spoke with the Lord and the Lord spoke with Adam. Now, God gave Adam and Eve, once Eve came around, a language so that they could also speak to one another. So God had this common language that he had where he could speak to Adam, Adam could speak to him, and Adam and Eve could speak. And you see, being able to understand thoughts as expressed through language is a very important tool of communication. I have thoughts in my head, and unless you're a mind reader, which you're not, you will never know what is inside my head, the thoughts, the intents of my heart. But as I form words and formulate sentences and let them flow from my mouth, you can get a download of what's going on inside here. So communication, words are very, very important to relationship. Even before there was a man to hear God speaking, there was a God who was speaking. And with the words that came forth from his mouth, he created the heavens, the earth, and all that dwell therein. God spoke, he communicated what was on his mind in words. As the words came out, they produce after their own kind. So communication is a key element that was around ever since the very beginning of time. In the Bible, Jesus Christ is known, one of his titles, as the Word of God. Now let's look together at John chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, verse 1 through 4 to begin with. says this, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, the Word's a person, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. So there is this one in the beginning, before all creation, named the Word. And who is he? We look down, same chapter, John 1, verse 14. The Word, capital W, became flesh, and his dwelling was among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is known as the Word of God. The elements, the creation, all hear God's voice and obey God's command. And as God spoke forth and said, let there be light, all the elements came into existence and began to obey God's commands. When God created the heavenly hosts, God spoke there was language, there was communication. He spoke to the angels and the angels heard God's voice and they obeyed his commands. And those that did not obey his commands heard his commands, but they did not obey. And those are what we call fallen angels. Both the demons and the angels listen to man's voice as well. They're listening to your words. Each and every day you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. We're not just talking about those that have died before you, but you are surrounded with heavenly beings. And heavenly beings are paying attention to the words that come forth from your mouth. The Bible says that every idle word shall be judged. The Bible says, by the words of our mouth, we will be justified or we will be condemned. By the words of our mouth, we are able to bind or release spirits, to interact for good. Those are the angelic spirits. Or evil, depending on the content of our words. Words are important. Communication is important. Without it, we could never really know each other or God. So here we find ourselves today living under the time called the New Covenant. That New Covenant has been made known to us through words, through the Scriptures. God's voice is heard again and again every time the Word of God is read aloud. God's Word tells us everything we need to know about everything that has to do with God and our relationship with Him, everything to do with life and godliness. The message of salvation is preached through words, and those words, if believed in your heart, can bring salvation to the hearer. Romans 10, 16 through 18 says this, But not all of them welcomed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith 
comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I ask, did they not hear? Indeed, they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The word of God has been preached to the ends of the world. And those that will receive the word of God can receive his salvation because it is declared to us through his word. First Thessalonians 2.13 says this, And we continually thank God that in receiving the word of God from us, you did not accept it as the word of men, but as the true word of God, the word now at work in you who believe. The word of God. As you receive the word of God, the word of God has the power to transform your life. So here is something that's a very important question. Do you hear God's voice for yourself? I mean, when you're praying, do you hear God's voice? I mean, I know you can hear God's voice through his word. That is one of the ways you hear God's voice. You can hear God's voice through the preaching of an anointed preacher. That's one way you can hear God's voice. You can hear God's voice by even observing nature. But can you, as you pray, hear God's voice? It is very important for us to hone in on that skill to be able to hear the voice of God for ourselves. We must understand that there are times in our life where there are decisions that must be made that cannot be found in the Bible. I'll give you an example. The Bible will tell you what kind of person to marry, but it won't tell you what their name is. So if you have a few people on the horizon to choose from, and you say, should I pursue this one or that one? Well, you need to get a word from God. You need God's direction because God has a person chosen for you. But how are you going to know? You're not going to flip through the pages of the Bible and find the name of the person that you've been looking at. So we need to be able to hear God's voice for ourselves. Um, those kind of names, those kind of specifics, you know, like where should I go to school? What job should I take? Those kind of specifics are not found in the scripture. Those are something where you need a rhema word from God. You need to hear from God for yourself. And God has made his voice available to his children so that we can hear his voice and can follow. So what is the key? The key that unlocks the whole kingdom of God is summed up always in one word, Jesus Christ. Without him, the door of access to the riches of God's knowledge are closed. You want to know how to do anything that cons concerns the kingdom of God, concerns your spiritual life. You have to know Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way. Jesus is the word of God. If you don't have him, you can't access God's words for your life. Jesus is the one who gives us guidance because we are his sheep and he is our shepherd, and a shepherd leads his sheep. The sheep don't uh, uh, lead the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't follow after the sheep, but the shepherd leads the sheep. And if we're his sheep, we follow him. And John 10, 27, this is what Jesus says. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Now, Jesus said something. He declared this. Before he died on the cross, he declared this before the Holy Spirit was sent to live within us. He said, my sheep, he says, I know them. They know me and they hear my voice. So once again with the question, do you hear his voice? Jesus was talking about his sheep. He's talking about his followers. And he was referring to them as sheep because the sheep recognize their shepherd's voice. You see, there's a lot of voices that speak. You know, sometimes you say, was that just me hearing that inside my head? Was that just my own voice? Was that the devil planting a thought in my head? Or was that the Holy Spirit? Jesus says, if you know him, you'll be able to discern his voice from all the other voices. But many of us don't believe that. Many of us don't pursue that. Many of us don't live that. But God wants us to know his voice. Now, when Jesus made this statement about his sheep hearing his voice, we do understand this. He had not yet died on the cross, and the Holy Spirit had not yet been given to his followers. So I suppose you could say his sheep at that time were those that were physically with him, and they were physically hearing his audible voice. But you know what? He is not here physically any longer. He is here in spirit, but not physically. He physically ascended into heaven. So we're not hearing his audible voice now we have to hear in a different way we have to hear through our spirit and his spirit speaks to our spirit just as much as he physically spoke to those people that were standing on earth right in front of him god still speaks and he speaks through his spirit let's take a look at john 16 12 through 15 
says this. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. I still have much to tell you, but you cannot hear it or bear it yet. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own, but he will speak what he hears, and he will declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me by taking from what is mine and disclosing it to you. Now, did you hear that? Jesus was saying that there's a lot of things I would like to tell my disciples as I'm here on earth before my death on the cross. He says, but you guys wouldn't get it right now, and you're not ready for it right now. But after I have ascended, he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and he's going to tell you those things. He's going to tell you of things to come and he's going to disclose to you the secrets that are found in my word. He's going to speak not of himself, but he's going to speak whatever the father says. So what the Bible tells us here is that we who are after the death of Christ, after the cross of Christ, we who live under the new covenant, we have received his spirit. And he says, the spirit himself will speak to you. Well, does he speak to you? As I said earlier, Jesus said to these disciples, there's a lot of things I'd like to tell you. He says, I could tell you these things right now with my mouth, but it's really not going to work out right now because you wouldn't possibly understand them. Now, Jesus had said to his disciples, as I mentioned, I have a lot of more things to tell you. I have a lot of things to tell you. I have a lot of things I'd like to disclose to you. He says, but I can't tell you yet because you're not ready yet. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be ready and I will disclose those to you because at that time you will be able to handle it because the Spirit himself is going to live inside you and he's going to teach you and he's going to guide you and he's going to lead you into all truth and he's going to disclose or he's going to give revelation to those things which I speak through my Spirit. So John 16, 13 says this, However, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare it to you. He will glorify me by taking from what is mine and disclosing it or giving you a revelation of it to you. So Jesus was telling his disciples that he was going to be able to tell them things later on through the spirit that he could not tell them then. And he was gonna tell them through a voice that was inside the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was going to speak. He was going to communicate with us. But I know a lot of Christians who really you, if you ask them if they ever hear the Holy Spirit, they say, I don't know. I don't think so. That is not the way it is supposed to be. The Holy Spirit, it says, he will guide us into all truth. Now, how do you think he's going to guide us? Some people think, well, it's just kind of a feeling we get. You know, we just get a feeling. I kind of feel like I should go this way. But here's what it says specifically. He will not speak of his own, but he will speak whatever he hears and declare it to you. It's actually saying the Holy Spirit won't just give you a feeling. He will speak to your spirit. Now, if you and I lived back in the 1700s, before the time of the invention of radios and telephones, we wouldn't be able to speak live and in real time with someone unless they were physically present with us. I mean, we couldn't talk to somebody on the other side of the earth live. We could send them a letter. We could send them a carrier pigeon. But talking to them live would be impossible unless they were within the proximity that was close enough for them to hear our voice. But now, because of electronic advances, we can speak live and in real time to people that are thousands of miles away, that are on the other side of the world. Now, Right now, I can talk to somebody that's in Europe. I can talk to somebody that's in Australia, somebody that's in Africa. Right now, live. Well, communication has developed to such a point that we're able to communicate with people real time. Well, don't you think when the Father sent his Holy Spirit to us, he sent us the device that was necessary to receive the communications from heaven, and he sent us his Spirit so that he could talk to us live and in real time. The Word of God is a guideline, but it's not always the specific guideline. In other words, there are some times the Word of God will not tell you which direction to turn right or left. He will not tell you which house to buy. He will not tell you which person to marry. And this is where you need to hear from Him live and in person. So the thing a lot of people don't really understand is that God not only wants you and I to feel free to talk to Him in prayer, but He actually wants you and I to be able to listen to him in prayer as well. See, we all know we're supposed to be praying. And we all know that prayer is something that, that we have considered for the largest part to be something we do 
not something God does. When really prayer is supposed to be a communication. Prayer is not a one-way street. We do not go into prayer and say, this is a time where I talk to God, but I don't listen. Prayer should be a time of communication between two parties where we talk to God and God talks to us. Now, obviously, as I said before, God speaks to us through his written word. Um, so how important is his written word? I'll tell you, it's very important. I'll tell you why. The written word is something that has been given to us that whether we have practiced hearing God's voice or not, his written word, word is plainly spelled out to us. And there's a purpose for that. He's given us his written word because it is the yardstick by which we measure every other word. In other words, if you think God is talking to you and telling you to go kill your neighbor, you have to compare that to the written word because nothing God says will be contradictory to what God has stated in his word. So the word is the thing that keeps us on the straight and narrow, on the, on the even keel, so that we can hear the voice of God, compare the voice of God to the word of God, and understand when it's God speaking. And God wants us to understand his voice, and he wants us to recognize his voice, because he does want to give us direction. And the words he speaks to us personally will never be contrary to his written word. That's a guideline that keeps us on track, that keeps us between the lines and the roads, so we don't end up in some ditch. So it's very important to know the word of God and then to take time to speak to God in prayer and to listen to God in prayer. And because the Lord wants to speak to us, he's installed the apparatus that we need to be able to communicate with him, to be able to have a live conversation 24-7, and that is the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Now, since God wanted Adam to be able to communicate with him, and because God sent his son personally to bring his message of redemption to us, and because God gave us his Holy Spirit so that we could be in constant, real-time connection with him, then isn't it obvious that God's will for you is that you would both be able to talk to God and to listen to him as well? We all understand we can talk to him, but we need to believe we should listen to him and be able to hear his voice as well. God is not hiding from us. God is not cutting people off from his presence. But God is, in fact, inviting everyone into personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And God desires us to know him intimately, which, of course, like all true intimate relationships, is founded on a deep and unreserved sharing of thoughts in communication. Communicating with the one you love allows you to be able to know the one you love and know their thoughts. And God wants to communicate with you and I. The Bible tells us that we who believe in Christ are members of Christ's body and that he is the head of that body. So let's look at Colossians 2, 18 and 19. It says this, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you with speculation about what he has seen. Such a man is puffed up without basis by his unspiritual mind. And he loses connection to the head. Listen to that. He loses connection to the head from whom the whole body, supported and knit together by its joints and ligaments, grows as God causes it to grow. Understand this. We are all as members of Christ's body. And as members of the body, we may have different functions. But I'm going to tell you this. The body and the body's members function under the direction of the head. The brain is the one that sends the signals or the messages to the body so that the hand will respond, so that the foot will respond, so that the eye will interpret. It is the head. And it says that we are members of the body and Christ is the head. So what happens when you disconnect, when you disconnect the communication between the head and the body? Well, what happens is the body parts are no longer under control of the head. Some of them will have uh, uh, epilepsy and things like that, but some of them will be simply um, paralyzed because there's no connection to the brain. There's no connection to the head. But God wants each member connected to the head. He wants us to be able to receive communications from the mind of Christ. So the interesting thing about that scripture we just read is verse 19. It says that this man that delves in all this craziness about, oh, well, he's worshiping angels and doing all this other stuff. It says, verse 19, Colossians 2, 19, and he loses connection to the head from whom the whole body, supported and knit together by its joints and ligaments, grows and causes it to grow. So this man has lost connection with the head. That's a problem. And if you lose connection with the head, it says 
that it is the head, the connection with the head that causes everything within the body to grow. You lose connection with the head, your growth stops. We are all members of Christ's body if Christ lives within us. And he does not intend for any member to lose its ability or its connection of communication with the head. Do you think that God intends for some of his members to be disconnected and they just don't hear from God and the other of us hear for them? So I'm going to tell the foot what it should do because it can't hear from the brain. It doesn't work that way. The brain talks directly to the foot. The brain talks to, directly to the hand. And that's how the body works together and functions. So the long story made short is this. God wants to hear your communication to him. And he wants you to hear his communication to you. He wants it to be a two-way communication. And if the two-way communication is not working, then the members of his body will not operate properly. Let me ask you this question. Do you want God to listen to you when you pray? Do you want him to hear your prayers? Or do you want him to ignore you? Or I'm saying, I can't hear you. We're not connected. I can't hear you. I want him to hear my prayers. We reap what we sow. In other words, we harvest whatever we've planted. Matthew 7, 12 says this, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the Law and the Prophets. So if you want somebody to treat you kindly, you need to treat them kindly. If you want them to show you grace, you need to show them grace. If you want them to offer forgiveness to you, you need to be able to forgive them too. Now that all makes perfect sense biblically, doesn't it? Well, that rule is universal. And it even includes our relationship with God. If you want God to hear you, he wants you to be listening to him. He wants you to hear him. Not only do we want to hear him, we want him to hear us. Not only do we want him to hear us, we want to hear him. That's a two-way communication. And that's when the body is connected to the head. That's what happens. Now, I know, I know, many people are saying, I'm willing, I want to hear from the head. I want to hear the voice of God, but I don't know how. Well, firstly, we need to understand this. Every single benefit that God offers to us, including hearing his voice, is obtainable by faith. But you're going to have to exercise some faith. So if you're in a church that does not believe in divine healing, and therefore you don't believe in divine healing, then the chances of you receiving divine healing or walking in divine healing are pretty slim because you don't believe for it. Well, if you're in a church that doesn't believe people hear the voice of God, you're probably not going to hear the voice of God either. You have to begin to say, you know what, if the Word of God says it, I believe it, regardless of what anybody's taught me. The Word of God says I can talk to God. The Word of God says that God will talk to me. The Word of God says, my sheep hear my voice. We need to stop saying, no, I don't. We need to say, if the Word of God says it, then yes, I do. I embrace that. By faith, I embrace that. I should be able to hear my Master's voice. So when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, some people who aren't walking in the faith of that word will say this, nope, never talks to me. Don't let that be you. Those who hear this word and have faith in what God has spoken through his word will say this instead. They'll say, if Jesus said, says that his sheep hear his voice, then let me by faith say this, I'm one of his sheep and I can hear his voice too. That is how faith speaks. Faith speaks in agreement with God's word. Now, I want to help you to have more faith, stronger faith, for clear communication with the Lord. So last week, we talked about the story of Lazarus and how that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Within that story, there is a message that many will just have read right over and missed. So we're going to go back to the story about Lazarus today, the moment that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and we're going to focus on on something that's not about Lazarus, but about what Jesus was doing. Let's look at John 11, 41 through 43. So they took the stone away. Then Jesus lifted up, up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew you always hear me, but I say this for the benefit of the people standing here, so they might believe that you sent me. After Jesus had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. All right. That was quick. Did you catch it, though? What was there to catch? Well, Jesus was praying. And uh, Jesus was praying aloud so that everybody there could hear what he was saying. And Jesus wanted everybody to hear what he was saying so they'd realize what was going on, that the Son was speaking to the Father. But let's look at exactly what he said when he was speaking to the Father. And that'll give us some understanding. 
about hearing the voice of God. So verse 41 says, 41 says this, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus lifted his eyes upward and said, here's what Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Stop. Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And then he says this in the 42nd verse, I know that you always hear me. So Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me in the past because I know that you always hear me. Jesus said something that's very important here, and it is the key to opening up our personal line of communication with the Father and having an unshakable faith in God speaking to us in our lives. 1 John 4, 17 says this, referring to Jesus, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. You know, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. And Jesus said this about himself while he was in this world. He said, I speak to you, Father, and you always listen. When I speak, Father, I know that you have heard me. Jesus said that about himself, but we can say that about ourselves. Father, when I pray, I know that you always hear me. I know that you heard me when I prayed before, and I know that you always listen to what I say. Jesus is God's son. He's vested with the authority of the kingdom of heaven. And guess what? So are you. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We have been given authority of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Jesus said something that we have a right to say, but we must exercise faith to say it and believe it. And we believe it because it's a truth, because it's a truth that's found in his word, and the word is the guideline for all truth. Jesus said, Father, I know that you have heard my prayers, and I know that you always hear me. Now, begin by faith to proclaim that for yourself. If it's true for Jesus, it's true for you. As he is in this world, so are we. So can you say that? Can you say with faith? Can you begin to believe with faith that, Father, I know you've heard my prayers, and I know that you always hear my prayers. In understanding this, we have uncovered some of the reasons for the feebleness in so many people's prayers, so much uncertainty in their prayers, because they are unsure that God has heard them. They're unsure that God is paying attention to them. They're unsure that God is listening to them. And if you're unsure God is listening to you, how can you possibly have faith in your prayers? In essence, many people pray like this without saying these words. They're praying like this. Father, I don't know if you hear me. I don't know if you're listening to me. I don't know if you're going to hear this prayer, but I sure hope you are. Jesus didn't pray that way. If that thought describes your prayer life, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's a prayer life without faith. When you say, Father, I'm not sure you're listening. I hope you're listening. You're saying, I don't have faith that you're listening. If you can doubt that he is listening, then you have every reason to doubt that he will answer. If you can doubt that he will answer, then I can be pretty certain to make this statement. He won't. He won't answer. If you're uncertain he's going to answer, he won't. Matthew 21 21 through 22 says this, truly I tell you, Jesus replied, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will you do what has been done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. If you believe, you'll receive whatever you ask in prayer. So it says, if you believe and do not doubt, you will receive. If I believe what? If I believe that God has heard my prayers, then I believe that this thing will come to pass. But if you doubt that he has heard your prayers, you're going to doubt that it's going to happen. But what happens if you begin to believe that when you pray, he always hears you? That's so important. Many people have no idea of the importance of this one fundamental key belief that needs to be in your life, that God always hears me. Believe that. God is always listening to me, and he's heard my prayers. He receives my prayers. He doesn't reject them. He listens to them. He hasn't turned a deaf ear towards me because I'm his child, and I'm his sheep, and he hears my voice, and I hear his voice. So here's something very important. I want you to look at John 5, 14 through 15, because this is key to being able to pray in faith, to be able to hear the master's voice. 
says this, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. In other words, this is the thing that gives us the faith, boldness, and confidence to approach God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. This verse, verse 14 says this, this is the confidence we have. Or you can put it this way. We have strong faith for this thing. For what thing? We have confidence for what thing? The answer is twofold. And it's this. Number one, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That means praying things that are not contrary to God's word. If you know God's word, then you're going to know what's contrary. If you say, you know, I met this guy one time that was telling me he prayed for, uh, you know, prayed for some marijuana and a guy came to his door. He asked Jesus for marijuana. A guy came to his door, knocked on his door and gave him marijuana to smoke. You know what? I don't believe God was hearing that prayer. I think the devil was listening to that prayer. That was contrary to what the word of God would say. But if we're praying for the healing of somebody, you know what? Uh, by his stripes we're healed. God has declared in his word that he is Jehovah Rapha, our healer. So God wants healing. So when you're praying a prayer of faith and it's about healing, you already know what God's will is. And it says, if we know that it is according to the Father's will, then we know that he's heard us. And here's the thing. When you know he's heard you, when you know that God hears you, it says then we know, that's a faith word, we know that we have the things we've asked. So how can you have faith to believe for the things you pray for? Well, you know what? You aren't going to have any faith for the things you pray for until you can first embrace this. God hears my prayers. He hears them. And I know if God hears my prayers, then I have the thing that I have asked already. We have to get to the point to where we can say like Jesus, Father, I know that you hear me. You always hear me. Then you can engage your faith fully because what this verse tells us is this. If we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. Did you hear that? If you know he hears you, like Jesus said, Father, I know you always hear me, then you know that you have whatever you've asked. You aren't just trying to believe for this thing, but you have moved from believing in to something that's more substantial, which is the knowing. You see, it doesn't say if you know he hears you, you believe he's going to give you what you've asked. But it says this, we know that if he hears us, we know that we have what we've asked for. Knowing is a far greater position to stand in than just saying, I kind of believe for it. Knowing goes beyond faith. Knowing is an absolute. Knowing says, I have no doubt. There is no doubt. He's heard me. And so there is no doubt he's answering me. The less you believe God is listening to you or that God hears your prayers, there's another thing that happens. The less you believe he's listening to you, the less you will hear him talking to you. This faith goes two ways. The more you believe he is listening to you, the more easily you will hear him when he speaks. You see, this faith for communication with God, for an open line between you and God, it goes both ways. Not only do you have to believe he hears you, but in that believing that he hears you, you will also have the faith to believe you hear him. This kind of faith, this knowing, is the thing that removes the spiritual earwax of unbelief and opens up our line of communication with the Father so that we can begin to hear him clearly and loudly, just as he can hear us. Back in the days of David, we have to recognize he didn't have the Holy Spirit living with him in him permanently as we do. And so it caused him to question sometimes. I wonder if God hears me. Psalm 13, 10, he says this, Lord, how long will you forget? Will you forget me? Will you forget me forever? How long do you look the other way? He's saying, Lord, you're not paying any attention to me at all. He was in a desperate place of doubt, of fear. Psalms 102, we see the psalmist begging the Lord to hear his prayer. It says this, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my plea. Do not turn away from me in my time of distress. Bend down to listen and answer me quickly when I call to you. So the psalmist is saying, Lord, please turn your head this way. Pay attention. Please bow your ear down. Hear what I'm saying. It's important that you listen. There was a question. Are you listening? But in this day we live in, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. And that was normal then. That is not normal for us now because the Father 
is listening when we pray. The Father hears every word that we speak, and we should be able to hear the words that he speaks back to us because the Lord lives inside us, and he's promised us in his word that as he has moved in and lives inside us, he says, and I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He has promised that he will speak to us through his Holy Spirit, and he will teach us and show us things to come. He's promised that our spirit and his spirit have merged together and become one spirit, and it's impossible for us to be distant from him. So how could he possibly not hear us? But sometimes our perception can create a thing that seems real that is not real. We can perceive that the Lord is distant from us, even though he can't be because he's one with us, that he's not uh, listening in on us, that he's not listening to our prayers. Our perception can create real feelings that are, I don't know if the Lord's hearing me. I don't know if the Lord's listening to me. And this can cause real doubt, which causes a lack of results in prayer. We need to daily remind ourselves of the facts, of the truth. We need to be able to say daily, Father, I know that you always hear me. I know that because you listen to me. I have things that I have asked of you, and I know that you've heard them. Knowing that the Lord hears your prayers gives you confidence and strong faith for the things you prayed for. The confidence and faith that is gained from the knowledge of knowing that he hears you also gives you a greater confidence and expectation in hearing God speak to you. My sheep hear my voice. Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. He never lies. You're his sheep. He says, you should hear my voice. The Lord is my shepherd. He's a year shepherd too. Then we should be able to hear his voice. Back in the days of Abraham, Hagar, who was Abraham's concubine, bore him Ishmael. And Ishmael was born from a servant woman, from a slave, a foreigner to her master. And she did not have a personal relationship with Abraham's God. But when Abraham sent her out into the wilderness with her son Ishmael, in that barren desert, the Lord appeared to her and spoke to her. And she had an encounter with the God of Abraham personally. And he let her know that he was watching her. He knew what she was going through. And after this encounter, her life was changed and her faith in God was increased. And this is what she said about that encounter found in Genesis 16, 13. So Hagar gave this name to the Lord who had spoken to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, here I have seen the one who sees me. Hagar was saying, you know what? I didn't know if you're up there. I didn't know if you're paying attention, but you showed me that you see me and I now see you because you see me. It's like us saying, Lord, I know you hear me. So now I know that you hear me and I hear you as well. Hagar had this burst of faith. She wasn't even of Abraham's household. She wasn't of the bloodline of the Jews at all, but she had an encounter with God. Knowing that God has seen her meant that God had acknowledged her as a person. Knowing that God was watching her caused her faith to catch fire in this God she had never known. She now could say something that was similar to what Jesus said at the uh, tomb of Lazarus. She could say, Father, I know you see me and you're always watching over me. And that kind of statement increases your faith and it increases your understanding of God's care for you and his response to you when you speak. When Hagar realized that God saw her, she saw God more clearly. As soon as she realized God could see her, her faith in God had increased. Now, back in the days of Job, at the end of his long trial, the Lord spoke to him. Now, all during his trial, the Lord had never spoken to him. He felt disconnected from God and felt that God couldn't care less about his problem. And God had turned a deaf ear towards him. And as long as he believed God wasn't listening to him and didn't care about him, his faith was in the gutter. But towards the end of his ordeal, the Lord spoke to him and everything changed. And the Lord said, I do listen to you. I know all about you. I know all about your life. I've been paying attention. When the Lord responded to Job, he was very humbled. But he said this, Job 42, 5, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Job knew now that God was paying attention, that God's eyes were upon him. And Job had met him in a personal encounter. And now Job's faith towards God went through the ceiling. He says, I used to hear about you. I've heard about you a lot, but now I've seen you myself. That changed everything. What you can discover from these examples 
these encounters that people have had with the living God is an important truth. The more you become aware of the fact that God is seeing you and hearing you 24-7, the more you'll begin to experience seeing and hearing Him as well. The line of communication is two-way, and if it's a unobstructed by unbelief, it will flow freely in both directions. And that's what God wants for you. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Did Jesus hear the voice of the Father? Did Jesus have an open line of communication with the Father? Didn't Jesus say, as I've heard the Father speaking, I speak. As I see the Father doing, I do. That should be our testimony as well. We need to begin to daily declare these truths. And that will begin to build up our faith, bolster our faith, strengthen our faith in both the praying, speaking, and the hearing of God's voice. So let's just say it together. Let's say, Lord, I thank you that you always hear my prayers. And Lord, I thank you that I can hear your voice because I am your sheep. Begin to say that daily and watch how the spiritual earwax will come out of your ears and you'll begin to hear God freely. God bless you. I hope that that's blessed you. Please apply these principles. I believe it can really change your life. So have a wonderful day, and I'll let my wife close in prayer now. Hello, church family. Good morning. Um, I hope everybody is doing well, and I know that we just had our first Sunday back in church, and I'm sorry to miss you all, but uh, as a lot of you know, I have a, a surgery coming up, and so I need to sort of... Um, protect against that and stay home. But I can't wait to see you all very soon. Uh, I've enjoyed our Zoom prayer sessions midweek. That's been wonderful. Church, I just want to encourage you with a verse that um, I was reading the other day in the Amplified version, and it's found in Luke 10, 19. In the Amplified, it says, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power the enemy possesses. Thank you, Jesus. He has given us mental and physical strength over all the power of the enemy. He's given us the ability to trample serpents and scorpions underfoot. So in other words, just like when Jesus, it said, he would come and crush the serpent's head, though the serpent would bruise his heel. Likewise, all things have been put under our feet. And there may be times when the enemy gets a shot in and he bruises our heel. But remember the end of the story, we crush his head because Jesus has made it possible that all things have been put under our feet because we're the body of Christ and we're in him. And he's given us all power, all mental, physical, ability to overcome all the power of the wicked one. Now, my prayer partner, Henry here, wants to encourage you. So we're going to just say a closing prayer now. Father, we thank you for the joy that you give us. Lord, it's a joy that comes from within, just like your peace, Lord, not as the world gives. You give us a joy that overflows, that goes beyond our circumstance, beyond our emotions, Lord. You give us a joy that's everlasting because it's the joy of our salvation. And Father, I just thank you that every person under the sound of my voice is experiencing your joy. And if they're lacking it, Father, I pray that they would begin to experience that overwhelming sense of your presence because in your presence, Lord, is fullness of joy and at your right hand pleasures forevermore. Father, we just pray that you continue to strengthen people, raise people off their sick bed where need be, restore jobs and finances where needed, and Lord, let the second half of 2020 be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Bye-bye. Henry says bye.